From Jakarta to London to Washington, millions of people have taken to the streets in solidarity with the Palestinian people, condemning Israel's war on Gaza and demanding an immediate ceasefire. But despite this, governments around the world, with the United States at the forefront, continue to support Tel Aviv. This despite the Israeli military killing thousands and thousands of Palestinian children. Is there a disconnect between the policies being pursued by the Biden administration and the American people? What is the sentiment amongst American public opinion? Let's take a sidebar and speak to Sean King, an activist and social rights uh, advocate based out of New York. Sean King, thank you very much for joining us on Sidebar. Um, you've been very vocal about what is happening in uh, Palestine, the uh, now uh, more than a month long war on Gaza, what many have described as uh, ethnic cleansing or even genocide being committed by the Israelis on the Palestinian people. Um, you're known for your activism in the United States, uh, maybe more so with regards to race relations, uh, racism or anti-racism work that you've done throughout the years. What is it that inspired you uh, or drove you to be uh, an outspoken critic of what is happening uh, currently? I'm, I'm glad you asked that question and I'm, I'm glad to be here with you. Um, first and foremost, and you may have heard me say this before, but I have to say it again, the primary reason that people will always see me fighting for Palestinians is some of my nearest and dearest friends are Palestinian. And as, as simple of a concept as that is, it all starts with friendship for me. Um, men and women that I see like my own sisters and brothers that have been there for me in the most difficult times of my life that have marched and protested and demonstrated alongside me that have fought alongside me for years uh, for uh, issues here in the United States dealing with police brutality and mass incarceration. My, my nearest and dearest friends are Palestinian. And what that has done is it's just made it personal for me. Uh, many of them have lost family members, uh, close friends, relatives, uh, professors, um, it's it's personal for me because I have important relationships in my life that make this very real. And I always wanna start there because it's almost immediately clear to me who actually has Palestinians in their lives and who doesn't. And it's very easy to treat Palestinians or anybody in the world for that matter as if they mean less or matter less when you don't actually know them, when you don't know their story, their history, and not just their pain, but but their joys, their love. Uh, Palestinians are, are real to me in 360 degrees of, of that reality. And so um, it starts with friendship, but there also are a lot of intersections for me um, I, I, I want to get into to those intersections, but just on that sure. point, obviously, as you mentioned, the, you know, obviously anything that is personal to one's life is going to inspire them to care more, to want to do more and so forth. Um, but definitely it's not limited to, 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 to those personal connections. And I know you're about to talk about that, but, but first you said something very important here, which is that it's, it's very clear from how people are reacting as to who has Palestinians in their lives and who doesn't. The truth is when we look at the uh, m you know, massive killing that has taken place, right? And you look at the essential war crimes that are unfolding, almost being live streamed actually uh, yep. in real yep. time, right? Uh, there must have been, don't you think, some, some huge level of dehumanization of Palestinians that would make it impossible or difficult for somebody who doesn't have a Palestinian in their life to feel sympathy? Like, does it really need somebody to have a Palestinian friend to sympathize with, you know, entire families being wiped off the registry or to sympathize with churches, mosques and schools being bombed? If this was happening in any other country and we saw it happening in other countries, not even to this level, much less, we saw outpouring of support for Ukraine, for others. So. What does that say, as far as you're concerned, with regards to the level of dehumanization that has occurred over decades with regards to Palestinians? 
Well, again, that's that's a great question and an important point to make. Anytime you see genocide or ethnic cleansing in the history of the world, before that genocide or ethnic cleansing begins, you have to dehumanize those people first to not only rationalize it for the people that are committing those war crimes, but for the everyday people in the country that's committing them. And Palestinians, and not just Palestinians, but Muslims and Arabs around the world have been so dehumanized in Western media and American media uh, and, and throughout other places around the world that uh, that immediate compassion that we saw happen in Ukraine, which, which I understand. Anytime you see millions of people were forced to flee Ukraine, and that broke my heart. I was sad for them that that happened. But immediately, uh, the default reaction from the American media uh, was understanding, compassion, and just endless coverage focused on their pain. Mm -hmm. But because Palestinians in particular have been dehumanized, often just ca called animals or brutes uh, by mainstream voices, suddenly when you see these horrible atrocities happen, it allows people psychologically to justify it. But there is something that's encouraging me. Millions and millions of people who, like me, may not have scores of Palestinian friends. I have friends in Gaza that I am actively concerned and worried about. But tens of millions of people who don't know them are now following journalists, photographers, and everyday people in Gaza, in the West Bank. And something beautiful and really important has happened. And it's a, it's a sea change from what I've seen in any previous year. There are now Palestinian journalists that have millions, some even more than 10 million followers. And now what's happening is everyday people, particularly young people, are following these young men and women who are on the ground, who call Gaza home, and it has made their pain and their plight real. Um, I, I think it's an essential development. You have to be able to see people's humanity when you need to care for them. And because Western media still isn't telling these stories the way they need to be told, Palestinians have been able to tell these stories for and themselves. And of course, that's, that, 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 that leads us to discussing issues in terms of reclaiming narrative and, and so forth. But before I get onto that, you, you were talking about cross sections, cross sections between uh, different just, sure. justice causes uh, that there are, right? And you spoke, we were speaking just now about the dehumanization. And I want to ask you if there are any parallels that you see can be drawn with regards to, for example, how African Americans have been depicted by establishment media, by establishment politicians, by uh, essentially uh, what have been controlled by uh, white uh, 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 politicians or journalists in terms of institutions and entities, and that dehumanization that we've seen of Palestinians in particular, and generally speaking, Arabs and Muslims as well, knowing and noting here, obviously, that there are many Christian Palestinians as well that exist. Sure. And I see every day hundreds of people on, on an average day. I may get 40 or 50,000 comments on my social media pages. I see hundreds of people daily, young African-Americans in particular, say that the things they see happening in Gaza and the West Bank often remind them of the ways African-Americans have been mistreated here in the United States. For instance, one of the most painful moments in all of American history, but particularly for African Americans, is this thing that we call the Tulsa race massacre that happened in the 1920s, where entire African American neighborhoods and businesses were completely leveled, where the local government dropped bombs on them. In essence, it was ethnic cleansing. Thousands of African Americans had to flee Tulsa, Oklahoma. That was 100 years ago. And it's still a point of pain for African-Americans. Even though it was 100 years ago, there are still three living survivors of that. And when we see that, and we see how hard it's been for any of the survivors uh, of the Tulsa race massacre to get justice, to just be acknowledged, what they suffered through 100 years ago reminds us of exactly what we see happening in Gaza today entire neighborhoods, business districts being leveled. 
And what I've tried to tell many of my friends, if what happened in Tulsa a hundred years ago still causes us pain, how must Palestinians who are experiencing it, as you say, man, in real time, this is the first genocide that's been live streamed and videoed and photographed and posted in real time like this. In essence, we've seen the equivalent of a thousand Tulsa race massacres in Gaza. Mm-hmm. And, and so I just I just say that to help people understand there are so many intersections, but not only that, um, American police departments are routinely trained by the Israeli military and Israeli police departments. In fact, many police departments were over there on October the 7th, October the 8th, being trained. Hmm. And so we see them using similar weapons, similar tactics. Uh, Just this morning, I saw police in the West Bank harassing and arresting an older, elder Palestinian woman. And immediately several people who saw that with me said it reminded them of the exact same thing that they've seen happen to elder African-American women here in the United States. And so we see a key thread through all of this. We see a key thread as being white supremacy. There was a viral video, I just posted it from yesterday, of a singer who was singing to the Israeli military just, just two days ago. And when he described Gazans, he said something, I had to get multiple interpreters to make sure that the interpretation was correct. He kept describing Gazans as black. And I was wondering, like, what is he saying there? Mm. And in essence, he is talking even about the color of Gazan's skin. There is this thread of white supremacy that goes through African-American culture. And now we see Palestinians being impacted by it as well. And um, it's it's painful to see. So would you, would you agree then there are those who say, um, at, in essence, what is the problem that Palestinians are struggling against um, is a struggle for liberation against what is being described by even uh, Israeli human rights organizations as an apartheid state and uh, what academics have described as the uh, largest or longest living uh, or currently existing, that is, uh, settler colonialist project uh, on, on earth. So how much of this is a war between Muslims and Jews, as some would like to predict, uh, uh, picture it or to 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 try and uh, uh, frame it as, and how much of it, in your view, is a uh, anti-racism, anti-colonialism struggle by an indigenous people? Thank you for that question. You know, one of my favorite leaders is a man named Ken Roth, who just retired as the CEO of Human Rights Watch, and human right, and and he's Jewish. He's a Jewish American. And Ken led that organization for nearly 30 years. Three years ago, three years before this current moment we're in, Human Rights Watch released a powerful white paper research project, almost 150 pages long, calling what Palestinians were dealing with apartheid. And that's Human Rights Watch. This is, that was led by a Jewish American. Uh, Amnesty International, three years ago, said, Yes, this is apartheid. We can go even farther back. Almost 20 years ago, American President Jimmy Carter, who had traveled there and been there, said, this is apartheid. This was a man that understood and studied apartheid in South Africa. Jimmy Carter called it apartheid. Desmond Tutu, who is beloved around the world, called it apartheid. And and here's the truth. Just calling it apartheid alone isn't even sufficient. It is apartheid. It is settler colonialism. And these phrases that we're using, these are phrases being used by the leading, most mainstream human rights organizations in the world. Mainstream scholars and researchers say, this is what this is. Now, we've had to add on top of this, ethnic cleansing, genocide, war crimes, The only thing that's different is just two months ago, I don't think most of the world understood this. You understood it. I understood it. The people I just named understood it. But now it's getting to the point, I hope to an inflection point, a breaking point, 
where hundreds of millions of people around the world also understand it, who didn't really understand it just two months ago. Because, as we said, their media doesn't tell them this. Mm -hmm. But now that people can see it with their own eyes, they understand it. So we are fighting against so many different forces. Yes, it is racism, bigotry. It is uh, Islamophobia. But it's not just any one of those things. It's a combination of all of them. So if we just said apartheid alone, that doesn't fully describe it. If we just said settler colonialism, mm -hmm. that that partly describes it. It's all of those things. So on, on that um, and and drawing on the comparisons or the examples that you mentioned, be it uh, uh, Tulsa race riots or, or, or what's happened then rather, sorry, be it uh, apartheid South Africa, uh, be it other examples in history, there has always been questions as to what is the best way to uh, uh, resist this. What is the legitimate way to resist this and overcome yep. this, right? now? One thing that everyone agrees on, I would uh, assume, is that the narrative is something that people now are becoming more aware of, those who at least hold dear to the principles of the sanctity of life, uh, to protect civilians and so forth, agree on that there is a shift in the narrative, that this idea that, uh, you know, the, the problem exists out of a vacuum is no longer being uh, seriously considered by those who have uh, a moral compass. Where the disagreement is, Sean, here, and this is where I want to ask you is, okay, how do you combat this? Do you combat it through boycott? Do you combat it through protests? Do you combat it through social media activism? Do you combat it through armed resistance? And these are all discussions that have had, like I say, say happened in the US, you've had between, you know, the school of uh, Malcolm X and, and Martin Luther King. Uh, you've had it in a, the, the discussions between Nelson Mandela's ANC and other anti-apartheid movements within there. And, and the list goes on in many other countries. It's almost, well, you can get yourself cancelled before you finish the sentence in the United States you if, you, so if you speak about some sort of resistance against this. Well, well let me just be very clear. And, and thankfully, I'm in a place where uh, I've already been cancelled. And so I can speak my mind very freely and clearly. Um, how you respond to deep, violent, systemic oppression is a very important conversation for us to have. It's a sensitive conversation, but it's a necessary conversation. And so we could study, for instance, American slavery. Well, how do you rebel against American slavery? We could study the civil rights movement. We could study South African apartheid. And let me say, each one of those comparisons, none of those are a perfect one-for-one -one comparison. It is to say, though, that there are moments in human history when people are being severely and brutally oppressed. And what we see now, which I think is one of the lowest points in my entire life, at least 12,000 Palestinians have been killed. Israel themselves say, no, the number is over 20,000 Palestinians have been killed. But before this past month, the brutality and oppression and repression were so severe that we must grapple with how do you respond to that? And when we study history, you, you gave some options. The challenge is any option people choose to respond to the oppression of Israel, when you respond in that way, they reject it. So for instance, I support boycotts. I support divestment. I support sanctions. That's called the BDS movement. But when you say you support that, people call you racist or anti-Semitic. Well, those are three peaceful, nonviolent ways to respond. What's powerful is the United States itself has called for the boycott of Russia, has called for sanctions against Russia, has called for divestment of Russia. So in a lot of ways, the United States supports the BDS movement just for another country. So it's not boycotts, divestment or sanctions that the U.S. disapproves of. It's just that they approve of it with one group and not another. Mm. So when we try those peaceful means, we're canceled, we're rejected. But those aren't the only means available. Yes, we protest, we demonstrate. And Palestinians do this. And Palestinians around the world have been protesting, have been boycotting. But there does come a time where every people group 
no matter who they are, no matter where they are in the world, feel like they have to defend themselves. And sometimes that's with force. If it's true that Israel has the right to defend itself, it's certainly simultaneously true that Palestinians have the right to defend themselves. That's only though that's only though if you consider them both to be human and this is where there is an issue I think when we were talking about it before in the end of the day what we've seen despite you know the Geneva Convention giving uh, uh, an occupied people the uh, right unequivocally under international law to defend themselves and despite uh, UN charters also allowing for that it's lost in the narrative um, here, I want to just ask something before I move on to a change in narrative and the disconnect between the people that we're seeing, the power of the people and the people in power, which is this. And I've had this with other guests on the show. And till now, nobody's been able to give me a very clear answer on this. And I want to know, you know, just different perspectives of it, right? You have had in the past 20 years, what has been described as the peace process that was pushed by the Palestinian Authority, namely in the beginning, Yasser Arafat, and then obviously Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen now, as well as other key figures, Hanan Ashrawi, Asaib Araqat, and so forth, right? In the past 20 years, the number of settlements have increased. They haven't decreased. The number of Palestinian children in jails have increased. They haven't decreased. The number of wars being waged on Gaza have been four in the past uh, 12. In the past 17 years, uh, Gaza has been turned into an open-air concentration camp, right? Where is the logic from an American perspective now and from the public opinion of where you reside and the people that you engage in, right? What is it that American establishment wants or those who are opposed to the forceful resistance of occupation? What is it that they want the Palestinian people to do in order to prevent these crimes from continuously being inflicted upon them, seeing as the peaceful way brought nothing but more misery? Well, uh, that's a very important thing for us to discuss. And again, I think we have to divide the American government in some ways apart from everyday people because polls show that everyday people in the United States have a very different view about what's going on right now than the government itself. Just for instance, a recent poll showed that nearly 70% of Americans across all political divides want a ceasefire. Well, you and I want way more than just a ceasefire, but just that simple act, 70% of Americans want it. But only one United States Senator has even called for it out of 100. So 1% of the government is calling for it, but 70% of Americans are calling for it. So I say that to say there's a huge divide between how everyday people are responding to this in the United States and around the world and how governments respond. Like we've seen massive protests with millions of people all around the world, but the governments of those countries still fail to respond, fail to intervene, fail to act. But there is a painful answer to your question. I think the American government would be completely content if Palestinians never responded, never rebelled, never fought back. I, you know the american government including joe biden and his spokespeople have said multiple times this phrase that they have quote no red line that israel can cross in other words they have openly publicly said that israel can do anything and that's okay with them but those same people have a hundred red lines that palestinians can never cross mm -hmm. and we have to investigate and interrogate why do you have so many red lines for one group and none at all for another. At the root of that is power. It is it is greed. It is white supremacy. Uh, we have to remember that Joe Biden called himself a Zionist. I found at least nine different times where Joe Biden called himself a Zionist. He literally said, I am a Zionist. And, and this is going back 35 years. Mm -hmm. And so he is now acting uh, on behalf of Zionism. And Zionism will never act uh, in a way that benefits Palestinians in any way. Um, even just yesterday, just yesterday, Joe Biden repeated multiple lies again mm -hmm. about beheaded Israeli babies. Mm -hmm. When the Israeli army said that didn't happen, mm -hmm. the White House itself a month ago 
said it didn't happen. But he's still repeating it. So we see American officials are not interested in truth. They're not interested in fairness. And I am increasingly convinced that I remember when 100 Palestinian children have been killed and it took my breath away. I'm, I'm a father of five. The idea that 100 children, which was more than all the Israeli children that have been killed in 25 years. And I remember when 100 Palestinian children have been killed and I, I couldn't breathe. I was so disgusted. We're now at nearly 7,000 Palestinian children that have been killed, that have been killed and counted or are stuck in the rubble. And the question I have is, how many is enough? And the more I have pushed that question, the more I honestly, earnestly believe that for the American government, no number would ever be enough. If 7,000 isn't enough, is 10,000? Is 100,000? Is a million enough? What is enough? When, uh, when politicians are viewed by their electorate as not representing them, and as this is something that you're, you've alluded to in that, uh, you know, we've seen the massive demonstrations both in D.C., in New York, in California, across actually the United States, as well as Western capitals and even Arab capitals and other countries around the world. But uh, there is a disconnect between what the people on the streets are calling for and what the people in the powers, uh, corridors of power are calling for. When the people in the corridors of power do not reflect the wishes of the people, then people usually should be able to vote them out. There is something in the United States, which I think our viewers would want to understand a bit more, which is there is really no difference between the Democrats and the Republicans when it comes to unwavering support for Zionism and Israel, uh, number one. Number two, there is uh, an almost um, forcible uh, commitment uh, that is being placed on American taxpayers to fund uh, illegal occupation and the militarization of uh, Israel. So, you know, the fact that all you can do is protest on the streets, the politicians know there's no difference. Who are you going to vote for? You didn't vote for Biden. You're going to have Trump in who, who would have given just as much uh, support. He himself says he would have given just as much support as the, the Israelis. So if there is no leverage in democracy, then what choice do the American people have to ensure that their tax money and that their representatives are not being used to further this genocide? Well, that's a very difficult question for American voters. And a lot of us are having to kind of take this step by step. And so Joe Biden is running for re-election to, to become the American president. Again, it's highly likely that the nominee he'll be running against is Donald Trump. Donald Trump, who is under multiple indictments. And just a quick point, Benjamin Netanyahu is also under multiple indictments of fraud and other things, just like Trump. Um, we are put in an impossible position. Uh, I'm 44 years old. Every year that I've been able to vote for the American president, I have voted. And I have always voted for the Democratic candidate, going, going back to, to John Kerry and Barack Obama and, and forward. There is no possible way that I could ever in good conscience vote for Joe Biden. I voted for Joe Biden in the previous election. I campaigned, I worked for the Bernie Sanders campaign. I campaigned against Joe Biden for nearly a year until he finally won the nomination. I believed or at least hoped that he would be a better president than Donald Trump. What we're finding on this issue is that there is no difference. And I could never, I, I believe Joe Biden to be a war criminal. I believe that he has knowingly, admittedly committed crimes against humanity. He has overseen war crimes and genocide and ethnic cleansing. And I could never vote for a man that has done such things, that has done so flippantly, a man that continues to promote false narratives and debunk conspiracy theories. So I am now put into position would I, would I vote for Donald Trump? No, but I cannot vote for Joe Biden. And so the challenge is in American democracy, really there are only two credible candidates, one from the Democratic Party, one from the Republican Party, and you're forced often to vote for one or the other. There will be some independent candidates who will have a very difficult time winning, 
I will still be voting in other elections and Senate elections and congressional mm -hmm. races and local races, but I could not sleep with myself at night and and know that I voted for a man that has helped oversee such atrocities. And what you're seeing just yesterday, Democrats voted, I mean, uh, uh, protested rather at the headquarters of the Democrats in Washington, D.C. We see Democrats all over the country saying, like, no, I could not vote for Joe Biden, not just Muslims, not just Arab Americans, but young people and millions of others are saying, no, you've lost me. And it will the way I see this is it will be up to Joe Biden and the Democrats to get other votes. They won't have my vote. And that then puts us in a very difficult position, because, as you said, Trump himself has said over the past few weeks that he would not only do what Joe Biden has done, but he would do even worse things. I believe him. So Americans are put in this position where either either major party candidate that we support pretty much sees this the same way. Um, I just believe that it's important for me as a voter and for other Democrats to show the party that we identify with that they can't just do anything in mm -hmm. our name and believe they'll still have our vote. So they've lost my vote, and I think they've lost millions of other voters as well. Sean, I want to end with a final question. Um, obviously, the, the people in Gaza and Palestine uh, at large um, view the stance taken by the U.S. administration consecutively over uh, you know, decades is one that has been skewed against them. And never, as you mentioned, never more apparent than now with, uh, you know, uh, fast tracking of military aid, the uh, repositioning uh, of, uh, um, you know, naval ships and so forth. Uh, uh, and obviously the use of, 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 uh, of uh, American military equipment to bomb uh, and kill children in hospitals and UN uh, refugee shelters and, and, and safe places and so forth. That is the way they view the American establishment and the American uh, uh, politicians. If you, as uh, a, an American activist uh, who represents a section of American society, were able to send a message to the people of Palestine, and particularly those in Gaza, what would your message be? Well, uh, two things. And thank you again for this time and for this moment to speak with you. Um, first and foremost, I've been so honored to uh, hear from Palestinians themselves. And I'm grateful that now millions of us, tens of millions of us, follow Palestinians in Gaza, in the West Bank, and we are learning directly from them what they want. And it's important for me and for all of us to make sure that we don't do as leaders before us have done, that we don't impose what we think Palestinians need on top of what Palestinians are calling for. I do want any Palestinians that that get a chance to see this, to hear this from me. Uh, if you are in Gaza or the West Bank or you're throughout the diaspora, so many of us have stopped our entire lives to join this struggle for the freedom, the safety, the security, the future of Palestinians. We are furiously fighting behind the scenes to do everything we can to stop the current onslaught. We're doing everything we can. I'm a part of multiple projects that are trying to see to that the International Criminal Court files char war crimes charges, genocide charges against those who are responsible for this. We're fighting in every way we know how to educate the public so that the world understands it but we know a ceasefire has to happen. A ceasefire seems like the least that the least that we could be asking for, but we know that almost nothing can happen without that uh, violence ending first. So I, I will close with the point of hope. I'm a historian by training. My undergraduate and graduate degrees are in history. And when I study the worst moments, the worst injustices in human history, Every injustice always comes to an end. It doesn't matter if it was slavery in America, a period of racism and discrimination that we call Jim Crow in America. It doesn't matter if it was apartheid in South Africa. Every injustice has a beginning, a middle, and an end. 
I don't know when this injustice that Palestinians are facing is going to end, but I believe with my whole heart, with every fiber of my being, that it will end. I hope and pray and I'm going to work to make it end as soon as humanly possible. But whether it ends tomorrow or next month or next year, I just need people to understand it will end. How we get there, when we get there, a lot of that is in our hands and in the hands of world leaders who, in my opinion, continue to fail to intervene and step up and do enough. Uh, it's important not only for the countries that surround uh, Palestine to intervene, but for countries around the world that identify with Palestinians to do everything they can to stop this. And so um, it, it hurts my heart almost to the point of tears to have to say to Palestinians, hold on, hang in there, we're fighting, we're doing our best. Because as we say that, they are suffering immensely. It is now winter in Gaza, people are cold, it is wet, people don't have food, water, medicine. Um, it's, it's a modern low in human history. And um, while I'm glad that the world sees these atrocities, um, I am disturbed at how willing the world is to see them and still do nothing. And yeah. so we'll continue <clears throat> to fight every day. Thank you very much, uh, Sean King, for your time and joining us here on Sidebar. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you, man.